Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Over the course of this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today we are honored to welcome to the show Oxford County Warden Marcus Ryan. And I should also add the Township of Zora Mayor Marcus Ryan. Marcus, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. I am uh, genuinely happy to be here and have the interest in both Zora and Oxford. <laughs> so, uh, Marcus, let's get the interview right out of the bat. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Yeah, um, I was, I, by, by training, uh, I, I went to school for mechanical engineering and I worked in automotive engineering for about a decade. And I was in, you know, a large company and not climbing a corporate ladder. You know, when you're in a large company, you're on a corporate ladder, whether you're aware of it or not, you're on one and all that kind of stuff. And my career was going well. Um, my wife and I had our first child and my wife's a partner in a business. And so she only took six months of the parental leave and I took the second six months. And I absolutely loved the six months of parental leave. And my um, employer at the time, I was not particularly thrilled with. They weren't a very progressive company. I wasn't really satisfied. I was offered promotion, but I was going to have to move. <clears throat> so we decided that I would be a stay-at-home dad. So that was in uh, that was in 2005. And I was a stay-at-home dad until our second child, uh, my daughter, was about to start school and realized that while I like being a stay-at-home dad, I was not into being sort of like a house husband all day, like hanging out at the house. Like there was only so much cleaning and tidying to be done. So I started a small engineering consulting business from home uh, that I was able to still, you know, get the kids on the bus in the morning, uh, get them off in the afternoon. I had the flexibility if the one of them was sick, I could look after them or I could go on a field trip with the kids, whatever. Um, and and started that going and that was getting going. It was slow, slow and steady, but, but going. And then the school board said they wanted to close my kids' school. Uh, A.J. Baker Public School in Contour in the Thames Valley District School Board and, uh, you know, got involved with the community, got more involved with the community, got more involved, started saying no to a little bit of business here, a little bit of business there. And eventually I just said, I got to put all my this work on hold. I just got to get this school thing solved. Then I'll go back to that. And then people started saying, you know, you, you should run for trustee. You should run for council. And I said, no, no that's not what this is. I just... I got a thing going here. I'm a stay-at-home dad. I got my engineering business. I like, keep the school open, get back to that. But honestly, um, you know, I think you said in your question, you said, where did you, where did you um feel this uh duty to 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 run? And and uh, as we reached the end of it, and I realized that we were in fact gonna save the school, I realized like, I think I know how to do stuff. I think I know how to get stuff done. And I really felt I had a little bit of that Spider-Man moment, you know. Um if you if you know how to stop bad things happening and you don't stop it, then you're kind of to blame for it. And I felt like I I think I can get things done for my community. And if I don't do it, I'm not really doing all that I could do. So I ran for council and that was, you know, I'm now in my third term. So. So there's a lot to unpack there, but I want to start with you as a young kid. I, I can't imagine someone who. Uh, uh, came to sort of politics later on after having a family and uh, two children that you ever thought to yourself, I'd ever want to be a politician growing up? Or am I wrong in saying that oh. politics was in your blood and it was talked at the dinner table growing well, up? No, no. It, so both are true, I would say. So I come from a stereotypical Irish family. My parents are both immigrants from Ireland. They came here in 1969 on their honeymoon. <clears throat> um, they've been here ever since. They're on a 54-year-old 54 year honeymoon, basically. And so we, you know, stereotypically as Irish people, we'd have, you know, whatever, however you characterize it, discussions, uh, arguments, fights about stuff all the time. I grew up with that, you know, constantly, we would have um, discussions about all kinds of things, all the things you're not supposed to talk about politics and religion and whatever. We talked about all those things all the time. But I never and so I always followed politics. It was always something that was important. I knew how it affected my life. But I never saw myself as directly playing a role in it you know i i voted in every single election i've ever been able to since i was a kid but i never imagined myself on the ballot um at all and and certainly when it was first suggested to me in the context of the saving the school i was like no 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 no, no. that's not that's not me that's not what this is like i you know um but then i but then i kind of started to realize like i i, I think i think that is who i am 
was it municipal politics that it was discussed or was it municipal politics Everything. that you followed? Really? Everything. Really? Because yeah. you were the very yeah. first municipal politician to say mm-hmm. municipal was actually discussed and you followed it because usually it's federal or provincial party politics, right? No, I, I mean, so my, my dad was a teacher. Um, my mom worked until until they had kids. And and um, in in uh, I hesitate to speak on behalf of all Irish people. I wasn't born there. I was born here. But I, all my family's from Ireland. But in, in, in Ireland, people talk about politics all the time, all, all the politics all the time. So they it's just um, it's a small country. It's a small island. Everybody knows. I mean, it's a it's a it's a bit of a joke, but it's a joke because it's true. Everybody knows everybody. You talk to an Irish person for five minutes, you know, and you'll find somebody that you know in common and that makes their politics very intimate too you know um and so they talk about it all the time you know what what's dublin county council doing about you know the transit or the roundabouts or whatever you know who are those councillors and voting on these things and and what's the national government doing about healthcare and a housing crisis they have their own housing crisis there and so so in in our house um i didn't realize it until i grew up and you know when you're a kid you're like this is the way the world is the way my family is is the way the world is right um, but we talked about all those things, you know, why, why is that development happening there? Why is that thing being built? You know, um, what's going on with education? What's going on with healthcare? What's going on with this national issue of, you know, whatever the case may be free trade or whatever. So, I mean, we probably talked more about federal and provincial issues, um, than, than municipal issues, but I was, I was always aware of all three levels of government that they all played a role in my life. I grew up rural. So in fairness, you know, municipal didn't have a, uh, as doesn't have as much of a direct impact on you. If you grew up rural where you provide your own water and wastewater services. Right. And there wasn't a, I didn't have a sidewalk or street lights. Um, but, but we, you know, we, yeah, we talked about all of them. You, you talked about sort of the catalyst that brought you into elected office was A.J. Barker Public School. And Baker. it was going to be A.J. Baker. Ba- A- Baker. I apologize. Uh, Baker yeah, School. No um, what did you learn about yourself during that campaign to save that school that finally sort of put that bug in your ear and said, OK, well, you coyly played it off saying, no, that's not what this is about. It yeah. was the catalyst that broke the camel's back to put you into the position you are today. So what did you yeah. learn about yourself and your leadership style that sort of made you think, maybe I can do this? I I distinctly remember there was a time when we were having, as with so many of these issues, you know, you're having a kitchen table meeting or whatever, right? Church basement meeting. And and um, where I live, where my family lives in Zora Township, um, we're, we're, we're new. We've only been there for 30 years. And... You know, it's still known, even though not, I'm the mayor and the warden, and it's still known as, as you know, the old clay place. That's where I, you know, like the mayor and the warden lives there for 30 years, but it doesn't matter who, who was there before, but that's what the name of that is. Um, there's people who've lived there for generations, right? When you look at the first time a rectangle was drawn on the map, it says a name there, and that's the family that lives there today, you know? So when this all happened, you know, my wife and I were like, we kept looking around and saying, well, surely these people are going to, you know, these people have been here forever, um are the one somebody's got to step up and like lead this thing and every time there was one of those meetings people kept turning and kind of looking at us and um and there was one meeting in particular where i realized um they 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 want me to say what we should do next and uh and it felt really weird because in those organic situations you know when when you're the mayor or the warden or or even a counselor um it's sort of explicit, right? We, so we've had a dis- formal discussion as a community and we voted and you, you now talk on that stuff. You tell us what you think and, you know, but when it's an organic sort of group of people in a room, it's a little bit uncomfortable and everybody, because you're like, so, so they're all looking at me, but how much do they really want me to say? Like how, where, where's the boundary here, you know? Um, but I distinctly remember that feeling where in that room, in that time, those people were looking at me and, and for whatever reason, they said, we want you to tell us what you think we should do. And then that was it. And it went. And, and I think something that I realized about myself that I maybe um, was not consciously aware of before was that I tend to be a pretty frank speaker. I'm, I tend to be sort of like, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what I think you might not like it, but whatever, I'm okay with it. I, 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 I don't feel like I really need a whole lot of, uh, I mean, I'm as much of a raging egomaniac as any politician is, right? You like you like to be popular and all that kind of stuff. But 
I'm frankly okay with people saying, I hear what you say, but I don't like it. And I'm like, that's fine. You know, um, if you want someone else to do the job, someone else can do the job. I mean, look, I'll be honest too. I'm, I'm quite privileged. My, like my wife and I are like financially, you know, well off, we're comfortable. I was, I was able to be a stay at home dad, you know, I, and I was able to, you know, frankly sacrifice a lot of money to go into municipal government. So I never felt like, oh, I, I need to be in this. This is my income. This is my retirement plan is to be elected and reelected and reelected. Um, so I was sort of always okay with like, look, I'll tell you who I am. And this is what I think Zora and Oxford should do. And if you like that, then you elect me and I'll work hard to get it done. And if you don't like that, then you pick someone else and I'll go back to my other life. And I think that is kind of what I learned about myself was that I was quite comfortable with just sort of saying, this is how I see it. If you like that, pick me. And if you don't, don't. And that's quite, I've learned that that's quite empowering as a politician. Is there an apathetic nature in Zora, the township of Zora in Oxford County? Because when I talk to municipal politicians across Canada, they would love to have people come up to them and talk to them about the issues, or they don't like the fact that you voted on something a certain way. Yeah. But it sounds like there is no apathetic nature in your communities. And I, I'm kind of envious that people are actually willing to give their opinions on certain things. I think, um, I think in general, there is probably more apathy nowadays in, you know, Zora, Oxford, Ontario, Canada, you know, Western democracies, you know, in general, if I can say, uh, than there has been historically. I mean, I, I think that's not a new thing. That's not a particular insight for me on that. I think we are all experiencing that in, in one form or another. Um, I think especially after the last round of municipal elections in Oxford, there was quite a few, um, you know, I don't know how, how do I characterize it? Pro progressive activist politicians. And I don't mean necessarily progressive. I mean, in some cases, progressive in their policies, but I mean, progressive as in they got elected to do stuff. They didn't get elected to I'll vote on what's put in front of me. Um, I'll make, you know, reasonable deliberation and choose the lesser or evil or whatever. They got elected to say, I want to do things. And whenever you have politicians who then want to do things, it elicits a response from residents then, right? You're, you're sort of forced then to say, I do or I do not support that thing. So I think for me, for my kind of, the things that motivate me in government, I like that. I'm, I'm here to do things. I'm not here to passively, you know, just vote on what's put in front of me. I, 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 I definitely view the role as, as the, the role of, a, of an elected official and in particular a mayor and a warden is to offer a vision to their community of, of leadership and say, this is where I think we need to go in 10, 20, 40, 50 years. And these are the policies that I think we need to enact in order to get there. And that, I think when that happens, um, it, it, it stimulates debate because, you know, if there's nothing on the table in terms of a vision and there isn't really anything to talk about, but as soon as you say, I think we should go over there, people are like, well, I didn't really know what I wanted, but I don't want that. Or I didn't really know what I wanted, but I do want that. And so I think if, if, um, if there is if there is any less apathy in Zora and Oxford, I think it's because there's been some relatively activist politicians who are putting forward policies to say, I think this is where we should go, and it, and it stimulates debate. Whether there is more or less apathy in Zora or Oxford, I don't I don't know that I know enough to know compared to other communities, but I think we are we are experiencing it to some extent the same as other places. You have mentioned the word progressive a few times in our like 10 minutes that we've been chatting so far, and we're recording this in the month of June. And I see the pride flag lapel pin that's on your button right now. Yeah. And I'm not trying to uh, paint a broad stroke here right now, but I grew up in Southern Ontario in a rural community as well. And seeing a mayor or even a warden or even a regional chair wear a pride flag in a county which is more traditional rural would not go over well 10 15 years ago and i'm not trying to pit one community against another right now but why is that important to you to be a progressive voice but a strong supporter and wear that lapel pin right now i firmly believe that everybody belongs and that is one of the underpinnings of the broad democracy society that we live in is that we have a mechanism to discuss our differing views on the communities that we want, whether your community is Zora, Oxford, Ontario, or Canada. And that's representative democracy. We, we have a debate and we choose our leaders and what those policies are. And then those people go in and they debate and they debate the policies and they enact them. The underpinning of that whole system is that everybody has to have a voice and everybody has to feel that they have a voice and they can bring that voice. Not that we're all gonna agree, but everybody's entitled to their voice. 
And as soon as we say that any one of those people has a lesser voice and isn't entitled to participate, we actually undermine the entire system. You know, I, I, I you know, wh whether it's whether it's to us LGBTQIA uh, rights or women's rights, it's not that long ago, right, that women couldn't do this job that I do or any job for that matter. They couldn't vote, um, you know, um, black rights to not be slaves, not be owned, Chinese head tax in Canada. Um, you know, there's a long history of these things. And every time we go through them, we then move past them and say, I can't believe we ever did that. We never as society go through it and say, actually, I think we could, I, I, we should go back to that. That when we owned people, let's go back to that. That was actually good. Let, we never do. So we always go through a tumultuous time where we try to figure out what we should be doing. But we do inevitably end up on the good side. I'm not going to pretend that society overall of humans has never had setbacks. It has. But we we do inevitably head towards progress, which is what, you know, that's where the word progressive comes from. I know in some in some political circles, progressive has a pejorative meaning nowadays. I don't think that it does. To me, it's progress. We all define our progress in different ways. But, you know, if I think about how are we going to get things done as Zora or Oxford, we have to include everyone. And that by definition means we're not all going to agree. But again, we have a mechanism to deal with this. And I just think that it is uh, absurd in this day and age to say that we are going to not include some people because of how they identify or who they love or what they wear. Um, I just don't care. You know, I, the, the flip side of that, I suppose, is people say, oh, we shouldn't judge people. It's not nice to judge people. Uh, and that's BS, right? We all judge people all the time, right? Um, you judge, who am I going to interview on this show? And who am I not going to interview on my show, right? We, we judge people when we hire people. Like, who am I going to hire? Who am I not going to hire? Who am I going to trust to babysit my children? Um, we, we judge people all the time. Um, the question is, how do we judge people? And I, and I think that uh, certainly in, in government, we should judge people on what they bring to our communities, what they bring to our society, and and not on you know uh, you know what genitals they have, what clothes they choose to wear, uh, who they choose to love. Um, and I think in general, you know, uh, more love is good. Uh, it's better than less love, I think. Uh, you know, uh, and it's not for me to judge who anybody uh, does or doesn't love. So to me, it's just it's just really simple. Everybody should be included, and that's it. Um, now let's get on with all talking amongst each other in this democratic system that we have about who we're going to elect to represent us, what those policies are, and let's talk about uh, how we're going to make our community a better place. Um, but we can't do that if we say exclude some people from that conversation. So how do you make the community a better place? Because as warden, you have to balance the needs and individuals, the needs and the wants of each of the communities that make up Oxford County. But you were also yeah. the mayor of your township as well. So there's yeah. there's got to be a little bit of bias that it goes into play when you're the warden of a county when it comes to the township of Zora. So how do you balance the needs and wants of individual townships while still looking at the bigger picture of the county as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I want to say that I don't have bias, but of course that's not true. We all have biases, right? Small, large, yeah. invisible, visible, whatever. But um, I think to me, um, that challenge of being both the mayor of Zora Township and the warden of Oxford County, or, or let's say the mayor of Zora Township and an Oxford County councilor, is that the, the services that each municipality, Zora and Oxford are responsible for are mostly different and exclusive so there isn't really necessarily a lot of competition there right so zora township's responsible for recreation and fire and local roads and building permits um and collecting the actual collection of taxes sending out the property tax bill and collecting it and oxford county is responsible for ambulance and long-term care and water and wastewater and land use planning so there isn't generally a whole lot of conflict there between the two. You're not, you know, I, I, I take a different oath. I get a different paycheck. I operate under a different procedural bylaw, different sections of the municipal act when I'm at each of those two councils. Um, it's very rare that there is actually a conflict, you know, a, a, an issue that is uh, considered by both councils in the same way. There is definitely issues that are tangential that touch, you know, for instance, you know, one of the ones is when two roads cross, like a Zora road and an Oxford road, an area municipal road and a, and a county regional road. 
but but those things are actually defined. There's agreements about that, right? About whose responsibility that is. Same thing when a county road crosses a provincial road. There's there's agreements about that. It's defined. Um, so most of those things are defined. And for me, I I honestly I can say in my you know uh, four and a half years on on both councils at the same time, I personally have never experienced a time where I where I sort of had to choose, am I am I voting with Zora or am I voting with Oxford? Because when you actually look at the Municipal Act and you look at the spheres of jurisdiction and the services of responsibility, it's pretty clear. And there really isn't a whole lot of opportunity for for conflict, in my opinion, in, in between the two. Do, do, does the average resident know that, though? Because you and I are kind of politically astute and we understand the yeah. different le levels of government. We understand that the county and the township and the province and the federal government all have their jurisdictions. But more municipalities across Canada right now are dealing with more provincial and federal issues because, let's be honest, downloading does exist and it does happen. And when yeah. residents come to you talking about a county issue as mayor of the township or a provincial issue as the county uh, warden, they don't yeah. care that it's a provincial or a federal or yeah. a town issue. They want you to fix it. So how do you balance the needs, but also the, uh, the, 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 the different jurisdictions that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? So circling back to the answer I gave <laughs> to your previous question, I usually just tell them this is how it actually works. And, you know, you, you may not like that that's how it works. And you may feel that I'm telling, I'm making it work that way because I'm telling you, but I'm just telling you, this is how it works. So if somebody comes to me and says, you know, they come to me as Zora mayor and they say, I got this issue, this issue, you know, why doesn't the township do that? And I say, well, actually that's a county issue. And um, one thing that's frustrating for me is frequently, as soon as they hear it's the county, they'll be like, oh, Oh, well, forget about it. And I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. I'm your county councillor. It's okay. If you thought I could deal with it as your Zora Township representative, I can equally deal with it as your Oxford <laughs> County one. But but even that level of government being that much bigger, that much further away, they're like, oh, I'm out. Oh, if it's the county, there's nothing that can be done. And I'm like, no, it absolutely can be done. We can we we can do this. So there's that. But the other thing is, if, if it is provincial, say, that's the level that I deal with most beyond the one that I'm on, less, less so with federal, but equally, um, uh, I'll, I'll say to them, like, you know, th there's a minister for that. And we have an MPP for that. And, you know, your, your MPP and that minister have more staff than I do. They can actually write legislation. They can vote on it. Um, they, they can actually deal with that thing for you. And they say, oh, yeah, but I can't get a hold of them. I can't get a straight answer. It's hard, whatever. And I'm like, you know, um, I don't know what to tell you, but that's, that's their job. Um, I, I, I have a job to do. And I, and people sometimes don't like that, you know, oh, no, never, never say it's not my job. Well, Every time I attempt to do somebody else's job, I'm doing less of the job that you're actually paying me to do. Like I, you, you've given me a set of uh, services that I'm supposed to deliver, whether it's Zora or Oxford, and, and powers to tax you to deliver those services. And if you ask me to go and do someone else's job, then I'm doing less of the job that you actually pay me to do and that I take your taxes for. Now, that being said, if there's things that the province of the federal government are doing that I think we need to lobby them on be, so, that, so that Zora or Oxford can deliver those services better... Um, then I'm I'm all for doing that. That's one of my my biggest things in this role is to go and advocate with other government partners um, to do things. But I think it's important that we do explain to residents that there are different different uh, levels of government that do different things, and that we have to engage with those levels of government. And we can't just throw our hands up and say, "Oh, that's hard. I'm not going to engage." That's a legitimate choice, but it is a choice. Do you feel like a conduit though? Because it it hurts me when when people say that they don't want to go talk to their provincial represent, yeah. representative because they don't get back to us. But yeah. municipal local governments, as Scott Pierce, the president of FCM, says, it's the government of proximity. You deal with people on a day to day basis. Do you feel like you have to be a conduit? And even if it's just send, sending an email to the MPPs off and saying, "We we've heard this issue. You need to address yeah. it with this person, this person, this person." Yeah, I mean, to some extent you are, that's the nature of being, you know, um, any elected official, but yeah, especially when you're an area municipal elected official, people know you and they've, they knew you before you were elected. <laughs> um, they'd see you at the soccer field and they see you after you're elected at the soccer field, they see you at the school, you know, um, and so there is a greater sense of residence, uh, I think of, of, um, you know, they, they can grab you, you know, they can talk to you, they, they're comfortable. And, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but I think equally part, part of, part of the job then, if you're going to be that accountable, that accessible to people is to explain to them how it actually works. Cause it does work a certain way. You know, I think it's fashionable nowadays in, you know, frankly, in politics, just about all over the world to talk about how government is broken and it doesn't work. And, and I frequently say to people, you know, 
I think we're not using it right. A lot of the time is the problem. We, we, you know, we, we have a screw and we, we pick up a hammer and we're trying to pound the screw in and we're like, this is a terrible screwdriver, but it's not, it's, it's a hammer. That's the problem. You know? So if you, if you think you're going to get what you want out of government by just showing up and saying, this is what I want, why don't you give it to me? Well, the system is explicitly designed, whether it's municipal, provincial or federal, it is explicitly designed for that not to happen. Right. It's not supposed to be, oh, Chris Brown showed up and he says he wants this. Okay, therefore we're going to do it. Well, what about all the other people in our society? What about them? You know, um, well, we just had an election and we chose who was going to be there. And so now you offer those solutions that you were elected to, to offer. And, and I think it's important as elected officials that we don't perpetuate this myth of the system is broken, but actually talk to our residents about how the system works. And if you get in there and you you work it, um, it works. My, my, my personal experience going from, you know, being a you know working engineer, stay at home dad, uh, and then trying to save the school. You know my my lived experience was everybody told me you couldn't save a school. That that school board had closed thirty two schools in a row before they got to ours. Um, not only and everybody said you can't do it. You know people were phoning my wife the night before the vote saying we're worried about Marcus's mental health because the school is going to close. We all know it. We knew it wasn't going to happen by then. We'd had the conversations, and and we knew. And no, so we got a unanimous vote to keep the school open. And the school board then wrote a letter to the minister of education saying we never even should have considered doing this. So that that goes from you know you're never going to keep the school open. Well, we kept it open. Well, that was a decade ago. Uh, the school's still open. We got a moratorium, province-wide moratorium on school closures. So you can't close a school in Ontario right now. That's been since 2017. Um, there was a the previous Liberal government was going to put a high-speed rail project through um, Zora and Oxford, cut our communities in half, cut all kinds of roads off. We engaged in that through the provincial election, got that stopped. I, to be clear, I still think that Southwestern Ontario needs better transit infrastructure, but not that project. Um, then, then there was a proposed landfill uh, for Zora Township, and everybody said, well, you can't do this. Once this is happening, the legislation is really powerful. You, you can't stop it. It's going to happen. We should fight it the good fight, but it's going to happen. You can't stop it. Well, I worked with the then mayor of Ingersoll, Ted Comiskey, and the mayor of Southwest Oxford, David Mayberry, and a whole bunch of community groups. And we got legislation changed in the province that gave municipalities the right to say no. And we said no, and we stopped the landfill. We're building 100% renewable infrastructure in Zora and Oxford and that's going to save us money and, and not pollute the planet. So all the things that people have told me can't be done, to me, my experience has been you can absolutely do these things. It's hard and it takes a long time. But the fact that something's hard and takes a long time doesn't mean it can't be done. It just means somebody's got to choose to do the work. So I think part of that is when residents come and say, I want this thing fixed and it and it's actually a provincial responsibility is I think we have to explain to them how the system works, that it actually does work away and you have to work it that way. And then you can get that thing done. And, and you know, the minister of whatever has staff and resources that I don't have for that issue. I have my staff and resources for this issue, but not for those ones. And it's important that we understand those things and try and work the system the right way and don't use a hammer to pound in a screw. How do you balance the needs of the many against the needs of the few? Because you, as the mayor and the warden, have to look at the bigger picture and drive the conversation forward. But people will come to you with their individual needs and say, I want a new playground. I want better access to on this road. I want my road even paved in some rural areas. Yeah. How do you say no to people when they do come to you and they say they want their issue fixed because they've come with the information. They understand that you're the level of government that they need to talk to. But you know, and I know that municipalities can't run deficits. So you have X amount of dollars each year and you can't run deficits. So how do you balance the needs of the many with the few? So I love the Star Trek reference there, by the way. I um, just talked to Sean Lewis and he put it in my oh, head. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, if I've known that, my buddy, Sean Lewis, he's a great guy. So I'm not surprised. I would have, I would have seen it coming a mile away then. I'm waiting for the Superman reference now too. Um, I So I, I, um, from the first time I campaigned for, you know, a little Ward 3 councillor in Zora Township, and then the first time I campaigned for mayor, I always came out with a platform. I don't know if that was always done, but I, I sort of thought, I sort of always thought about this the, the backwards. I don't know whether I became an engineer because I think this way, or I think this way because I, became, because I was an engineer, but I always think about what's the current state and what's the desired state. And now what do I have to do to move from one to the other? So when I thought about first running for office and every campaign since then, I always thought about, so if I get in and then after four years, what have I done? Okay, now work back from that. And then I was like, I think that's my campaign platform. If those are the things that I want to have done at the end of those four years, that's what I should tell people. And so I always did that. And I said, look, this is my understanding of Zora and Oxford. 
Um, this is my policy proposal. This is what I think the issues and opportunities are. This is the policy proposals I have to do it. And again, if you want me to do it, uh, vote for me, hire me. And if you don't, then choose someone else. Um, but if I, if you choose me, these are the things that I'm going to do. And so then to me, when, when people come to me after the election and say, but I want this or that, I say, you know, I, I hear you and I understand you and you, you have every right to do that. And maybe you're right and I'm wrong. Um, but I got elected on doing these things. And I have now a responsibility to try to deliver on those things. I'm there, There's no party uh, system in, in municipal government, so I can't promise you that I'll do them. I have to issue by issue. I have to get the votes. But I feel having explicitly told people what my platform is that I then have a responsibility to try to deliver on that platform. Um, and so that's largely when when they say something that is different than me, I say, like, I, I was transparent with you and I told you what I wanted to do, what I what I thought we should do for our community. And I'm going to do that. Uh, I feel like I have an obligation to deliver on the things that I committed to, and I'm and I'm going to do that. Correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm not 100% sure what in Southern Ontario, but Oxford County, you're not elected to that position. If you're elected to the township of Zora, you Correct. are appointed to the Oxford County. So how do you balance the position of warden? Because you're, there's no yeah. campaign manual or campaign platform that you can put out to the people of Oxford County and say, this is what I'm going to do in four years, yeah. because you are elected by the council, the Oxford County Council. Yeah. It's a uh, it's a different thing. You're you're indirectly elected, right? It's indirect yeah. democ representative democracy. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a different thing for sure. Um, I I I will say though, bit of a weird situation, but I did not campaign for a warden at all. I did not ask a single member of county council uh, to support me for warden. Um, it happened, it happened organically. Um, a few of them said, "We think you should be warden," and I said, "Well, if." I'm 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 willing I'm willing to do it if you think I should do it and they they talked among talked amongst each other and uh, they nominated me and they didn't nominate anyone else and that was that so um, I think a majority of them had been on council with me the previous term and I you know as we said at the beginning of the interview I tend to be pretty frank and say like this is what I think um, and that's that so if you like it pick me and if you don't don't um, and they did so. I, I, I'm, I do. I'm sensing a pattern here, Marcus, because you, you kind of get picked for the school closure committee to sort of lead that. You kind of get picked for Oxford <laughs> County uh, awarded. Are you just lucky? Like, is there a horseshoe that you're hiding? <laughs> You know, I, I I don't know. I mean, you you could make you could equally make an argument that I'm unlucky to be in the position that I'm in. You know, I mean, like it, like every job, there's there's good days and there's bad days, right? Um, but I think. I think that there is, to some extent, um, yeah, it's hard to talk about this without sounding like you're blowing, tooting your own horn, but I try to <clears throat> I try to do this job with integrity and honesty and just say, like, look, this is how our system works. I, I offer myself to serve my community. And I'm going to get paid, you know, and I get some, some powers to do things. But along with that is the responsibility. And to me, that is to say, look, this is what I'm offering. And I, I, you know, I had a conversation with a bunch of residents a few weeks ago, conversation. It wasn't a very pleasant one, but they, I, I was proposing to do a thing that they didn't want done. And I said, well, I, you know, I campaigned on this and they said, well, but you're supposed to do what we want. And I said, no, 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 I'm supposed to do what I promised Zora and Oxford residents I would do if I was elected. And we had a discussion about that. That's how our system works. We had a discussion all last summer and we had an election in October and they said, you go and do those things. And so I'm going to do those things. And they were very frustrated with that. They said, but you're supposed to represent us. And I said, yeah, I'm supposed to represent everyone though. All 9,000 residents of Oxford, all 130,000 residents of, uh, 9,000 residents of Zora, 130,000 residents of Oxford, not you personally, right? And the way we decide what those issues are is we have an election and everybody says what they think and then you choose. And now it's my job to do that. Um, and I've just tried to always kind of do it that way. And I, 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 the, other, I, I the other thing I should add is, you know, when I when I was ward councillor and before I ran for mayor, I had a couple of run-ins with people like that where I was doing a thing that they didn't like. And I just said, Well, look, I I I think I have to do this. I think this is what's best for the township, and that's what I'm gonna that's what I'm gonna do. And here's my reasons. And and again, if I mean if you don't like it, there'll be an election and you you get me unelected, and that's fine. Um two of those people who I literally had shouting at me in those circumstances asked for a campaign sign for me when I ran for mayor my first time. So First glance, you're like, that's really weird. So they went from shouting at the guy to asking for a campaign sign. But I, my observation, right or wrong, but my observation is 
they didn't like my position on that issue, but they respected that I said, this is my position and this is why it is. And I stuck to it. And I think they appreciated that integrity. And I think that there's a lesson for all politicians in that, frankly, not, not for me to give them, but for our residents, our voters to give us. And that is there is room to disagree on things if you do it respectfully and explain your position. I think people know that we're not all going to agree on everything, but can we disagree respectfully? Are you willing to 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 explain and defend your position and stick to your guns? Um, I think people actually do like that and want that. That that's what leadership is, right? Like the, that that's what leadership is: is saying I have a position, I'm able to explain it, and I'm going to try and achieve it, as opposed to pandering and and you know going down a path of of populism and whatever's going to get me reelected. I want to turn to the issues for a few seconds here. And I want to start by saying this. This is a conversation between the warden and myself. This is not a direction of counsel or a motion of counsel. I seem to get very strongly worded emails when I ask this question. I don't know why, but here we are in 2023. Warden, yeah. in your opinion, what is the biggest issue or issues facing the uh, Oxford County as of recording this? And how are you as warden trying to uh, alleviate some of those issues? I think um, I think there's there's in a strict municipal sense services that we deliver it's housing and that's not unique to Oxford. Um, it ha housing is literally a crisis, right? So uh, not that long ago, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, there was there was no visible homeless in Woodstock, the largest city in Oxford, Canada. There was no visible homeless at all. Um, there were homeless, right? There was always people couch surfing. People in their 30s and 40s living in their childhood bedroom because they can't afford to move out. You know, you can make your arguments of whether that's homeless or not, but it's always been there. But visible homeless was not in Oxford County. Now it's everywhere. And I'll point out that as a, as a rural mayor, I, I live on a gravel road, uh, farm fields on two sides, forests on the other two sides. There's no one to ask for a handout on my road. There's nowhere to spend that handout if you get it. But last summer, there was a couple trying to make their way homeless on my gravel road in rural Oxford County. So I frequently say to residents when we talk about these issues, you know, how desperate does your situation have to get that you think I'm going to try and make a go of it on gravel 23rd line in Zora Township? That's a pretty desperate set of circumstances you find yourself in. So housing of all types, the full spectrum of housing from emergency shelter um, and frankly, I think we should even be talking really in the housing context about people who are not even in emergency shelter, but living in a tent, you know, uh, um, right now the housing crisis is so bad that in some cases, the best that you can do for a person is have them in a tent and make sure they're safe in that tent and not being evicted from their, from their tent under a bridge. That certainly can't be the solution for tomorrow, but in some cases it's the best you can do for someone today. <clears throat> we certainly shouldn't be evicting them from their tents, but we have to look at the entire housing spectrum. And so that in, in this context of strict, you know, municipal services that we are obligated to deliver, uh, housing is, is the biggest issue. I think broader than that, I think, uh, touched on this before, all communities, societies in, you know, Ontario, Canada, North America, Europe, are struggling with, you know, sort of existential tensions right now, right? And some of those are to do with inflation, interest rates, some of them are to do with some of the things we touched on before about, you know, people's confidence in democracy or even understanding of how their democracy works. I think when people don't understand how it works, then you start to get afraid. Like, I, who actually does make the decisions that govern my life? Like, who actually is in charge? I, I personally think, I'm not going to pretend that, you know, a, bit, a little bit more knowledge will solve that. But I do, I am shocked frequently at the people that I talk to who don't, literally don't understand how it works. And, you, you know, and I, I wonder how much fear does that engender when you simply don't know how your world works. And once you're afraid, it's even harder for knowledge to overcome that fear. So I, I, I do think we need to talk about how our government works and why it works the way that it does more often. Um, but I think that that is, a, that is a challenge because if people don't know how their government works and if they're afraid of how the world works, it's much harder to have constructive conversations with them about how to change how it works to actually address all the other issues. So that's not strictly speaking a, you know, a municipal function, uh, not the job of a mayor or a warden. Um, but I but think isn't it though? Don't, isn't it well, though? I, so I was just going to say, I think if we don't actually attempt to address those, and again, hence the pride pin... <laughs> If we don't actually try to include everyone, then then you know we we can talk about housing, we can talk about paving roads, we can talk about uh, you know emergency response, long term care, all we want. But if people don't 
feel that they can actively participate in that decision making, if they don't feel like they're represented in that decision making, if they don't have confidence that it's being made, the decisions are being made with integrity, then then your ability to solve all those problems or improve those things in any way is dramatically undermined. So so yeah, so that's part of why I think it is the job of a mayor of a warden. And that's why I wear the pride pin. And and in Oxford County, all the area municipalities got together to come up with a safe and well Oxford plan. Because when we asked residents, you know, what makes you feel safe and well in Oxford, the answer was stunning. You would think when you asked residents, what makes you feel safe and well in Oxford, you would think healthcare, housing, education, access to a doctor. These are the things that make you feel safe and well, right? No. The number one thing our residents told us in the survey by a long shot was belonging. That was the number one thing they told us. Really? Belonging. I, I, yeah. And and to, well, think about the question you just asked me. You said, what, but isn't it the job of the mayor of the warden to make people feel that they that they can engage with their government? And so I think in a way, I'm not going to pretend that all of our residents have thought about this and the mechanisms of two-tier municipal government and provincial responsibilities. But but when they tell us that I need to feel like I belong, what they're really saying is if I don't feel like I'm part of the system that governs me, then I don't have confidence that you can look after my housing or my clean drinking water or my fire response or my recreation, right? If, if you're going to address any of those things, I need to feel like I belong and my family and my friends and my kids and everybody needs to feel like they belong. So so Oxford and all the area municipalities have adopted our Safe and Well Oxford plan. And that is one of the explicit goals of it is to say, people need to feel like they belong. And if you think about it, how can we, you know, either improve all, uh, you know, uh, services that we deliver, realize new opportunities or address deficiencies? How can we do that if everybody doesn't feel like they belong? And I think when you look at some situations like in the United States, what you're seeing is a lot of people saying, I don't belong. And I feel like I don't belong so bad. I'm willing to burn the whole place down because I don't feel like any of this is working for me. Right. And to my point earlier into your question about, you know, engaging with provincial politicians, I think it's really important that we talk to residents about how it actually works and that you can make it work. It's imperfect. Nothing's perfect, but it can be made to work. But but people need to feel like they belong. They need to feel the sense of empowerment that representative democracy should give them. And we need to talk about that more um, so that they belong. And so they know you can vote. And it doesn't matter you know, who you are. You, you're, you're here and you're a citizen and you get to vote. And so exercise that franchise that you get to vote and then feel like you belong. And then when we're all doing that, then we can talk about what the real um, you know, opportunities and challenges are. So to follow up on that question, it will be my last question because I know you're a busy man. Um, what makes Oxford County such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family with regards to the Safe and Well Oxford plan? I think, you know, there's a really unique combination of Oxford in Oxford of really, really, really rural and really, really, really urban places. And you can be in one or the other in a few minutes. Um, I my, my, my house is on a gravel road. I live across the road from a conservation area, Woodlot beside me. I regularly have, you know, deer in my yard um koi wolves great horned owls um bald eagles flying over the backyard my kids grew up seeing deer and wild turkeys cross the road while they're waiting for the bus um, um 30 minutes after they get on the bus i'm here at my office in downtown woodstock uh, and all the retail opportunities there are here of of all the you know thriving little uh little coffee shop businesses and and big big box stores if that's your thing and and all that kind of stuff and, and we have that, you know, different versions of that in Ingersoll and Tilsonburg as well. And in between all these, you know, beautiful fields where we grow everybody's food in Ontario and natural spaces like, you know, Pittock Conservation Area and Wildwood Conservation Area. And there's a great diversity available to people where you can have, if, if urban is your thing, you can live in downtown Woodstock and all that and, and get all your services and everything. Um, and you can just go out into the countryside and go for a hike on the weekend. Um, if it's the other way around and I, like I choose to live in a rural area and peace and quiet when I go home at night and I can see all the stars and car goes down the road and you're like, who's that? Why is there a car going down the road? Who is that? I didn't recognize that car. Um, but, but again, in, in, you know, in, in 20 minutes, I can be in, I can be in Ingersoll and sitting in uh, the, you know, the old village bakery and having baked goods and a really good coffee and, and, and walk down the road to a Thai restaurant. And, and it's all very close. Um, and I think to me, that's what I like about it is I get to live rural, like I personally choose to do, but those, those amenities of like urban areas are really close by. And I think also, in the living memory of a lot of Oxford residents, even the people who don't live rural anymore, don't live on the farm, it's close enough that 
it's culturally still part of who we are. Um, and so, so th th I'm, I'm not going to lie. There's a bit of a rural, rural urban divide everywhere. Um, but I think it's kind of a, uh, it's a closer, uh, divide the, the, the line is, is finer here. And, and I think being able to have, to have a live with a foot in both of those worlds is a, is a really unique thing that, that Oxford offers that, that rural urban combination. And you can experience it within 15 minutes of each other, uh, short car ride and, and no people in both of those places. Uh, Marcus, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. It's always an honor to sit down and chat with someone who's so informative, but also who likes to talk about uh, the municipal issues because it's hard to sometimes find those uh, type of people. So thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for this uh, interest in Zora and Oxford. I really appreciate uh, this this podcast and taking an interest in these issues is something, as we've talked about today, something that I don't think gets talked about enough. And it and it actually matters to people more than they realize. So I, I, I can't thank you enough for taking the interest in, in the issue in general, but in particular in Zora and Oxford. Thanks very much, Chris. So with that, I want to remind everyone to put down your phone for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps her society and helps her democracy. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews. We will be back tomorrow with another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Until then, just keep talking.